Uh, we thank you all for coming to the uh, 2017 Spotlight on Aluminum session. We've got a, an action-packed agenda, and to get through four excellent speakers with some excellent content, uh, I'm going to be extremely brief. My name is Matt Kripke. I'm with Kripke Enterprises in Toledo, Ohio. That's it. Uh, first, I'd like to bring up Jeff Henderson. Um, Mr. Henderson is uh, the exec director, I believe. Is that the title? President, excuse me, the president of the American Extruders Council. He came there in early 2014 as director of operations for the AEC. And in the spring of 2016, he was elected president. Well, had I read on, that was, that's right there. Previously, Mr. Henderson was responsible for all of SAPA North America's branding, commercial strategies, and development of new business and applications using aluminum extrusions. He's a 25-year veteran of the industry, and in 2015, he purchased the Sanford Organization, an association management company that manages trade associations, such as the AEC. In addition to the AEC, TSO also manages the Aluminum Anodizers Council, the International Fair Trade Alliance, and helps with communications and fundraising for the Curtain Wall Coalition. I did ask each member, since we are in New Orleans, and this is an eating town, what has been their favorite food so far in New Orleans? Jeff's is gumbo. Come on up, Jeff. You can clap. <laughs> well, I've only got 15 minutes, so I want to go quickly. And if I scan over a slide too fast, I'll stick around to the reception uh, to answer any questions you might have. Today, I want to just give you an update um, on the status of the Aluminum Extruder Council's uh, efforts in the trade arena dealing with China on aluminum, and we'll go through several issues there. The first one is really our good news. The best news I could deliver is that we were renewed during our sunset review for five more years by the International Trade Commission. Our trade orders are in place for five years. We go through a, what they call a sunset review, and the orders are either extended or not. In our case, they were extended with a unanimous vote. Also, uh, the, the other part of the good news was that there were three different product categories that came forward seeking an exclusion to our orders, claiming that, they, that their extrusions were dissimilar to the extrusions that we make. The ITC agreed with us in all three areas, and those product groups are still covered by our orders. So this was very good news and a huge amount of effort on our, uh, on our industry's part. The current state of the industry, the aluminum extrusion industry, is good. We're not quite to the pre-Chinese surge levels, and we're not nearly, well, I wouldn't say nearly, but we're, then the next hurdle would be up to pre-recession levels. But the industry has been recovering over the last few years, including in the areas of margins and prices, which has been good. Extruders have responded to those improvements by investing back in plant equipment and human resources to the tune of nearly $2 billion since the orders took place. This massive capitalization in our industry has positioned them to be in a position now to interface with more sophisticated uh, end users like the automotive market. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. We'll start with this uh, data point here. When the orders took effect against China, the preliminary orders were actually effective October 1st, 2010. The September 2010 import data showed that China had exported about 70 million pounds into the United States. When the orders took effect October, less than a million pounds were brought into the United States since at that time. And since then, we've only seen Chinese imports, at least those recorded, as being a very nominal amount in a market. However, in the other areas, the, the, the yellow orangish area there, you'll see that non-subject countries, their contribution to our market has increased. And we're gonna talk about our concerns about that in a minute. So as we've gone forward at this stage of our case, some of the biggest issues that we've had to challenge have to do with transshipment and circumvention most notably out of Vietnam, Indonesia, and Malaysia. And this is something we're taking a very close look at. The root of the issue is China's continued excess aluminum capacity. They're continuing to make aluminum. They're forcing it into semi-fabricated and downstream operations 
for export. It's clear that the Chinese intend to export their way out of this overcapacity situation. The third one is on their market economy status before the WTO, and we'll talk about that in a minute too. But these are three key issues that we're looking at right now. So to, so to highlight this a little bit better, so where did Chinese exports end up? Once the spigot uh, stopped into the United States, where did they go? If you look at where they went, you know, as far as the U.S., you're looking at the very thin blue line at the bottom. As you can see, it's a negligible amount. But look at that orange bar, Vietnam. And I guess the, the, the silly question is, what is Vietnam doing with all of those extrusions? We're not talking about an industrial powerhouse here. And so this, this is the kind of data that we've been reviewing recently. The gray bar above the Vietnam is Malaysia. When you look at those countries and you take a look at what their capacity is, the number of presses, and by the way, all of the data I'm gonna to present to you today came out of the ITC's uh, public staff report. Not all the slides ended up being sourced, but that's where it came from. Given the number of presses and, and knowing that these are very small presses, does this make sense for that capacity to account for the growing imports into, or exports into the United States? Accumulatively, these three countries have now taken more than 2% market share. Somewhere inside of that, the numbers just don't add up. As a, as a direct result of this, as they've gained uh, market share, which you can see through the red line, they're doing that through a reduction in the price. And you can see the correlation between the two. And this includes Vietnam, Indonesia, and Malaysia. This is a bit of what we were looking at in regards to China, say, 10 years ago. And as that's happened, it's impacted our operating margins here in the United States. Just in one year, from 2015 to 2016, that market share number has now gone up to nearly two and a half points, and it's already had an impact on our operating margins. Another way stated, U.S. production into the domestic market has fallen as a result of it. In other words, those imports didn't affect another country's imports. They're beginning to affect U.S. production, and as a result, our margins continue to drop. And the root of the problem is excess aluminum capacity. I'm sure you'll hear others talk more about this, but this slide is becoming all too familiar. China, in the red line, has just skyrocketed over the last few years. We all know that, and that's a big part of the reason why many of us are here today. The rest of the world has remained flat. And the question on this becomes is, how much of all of that production is truly excess capacity? So at the ITC, the, the, in their public staff report, they went through the numbers and came out with, a, with a, a calculus that said, if you take their total production, you subtract from it the best available data on their consumption, and then add to it what they export, here's what you come to. The full year that we had available is 2015, 8,000, or 8 million rather, metric tons of excess capacity being generated out of China. So how do we address that? There are several fronts that we're working with others to, to, to make the case to, to, to stop this, uh, this uh, uh, practice. IMF is one. You may have read about the, the growing industrial bubble being, and, and the debt bubble in China. It's getting to a point that many industries are talking directly with IMF about this to see what they can do to influence it. Late in the Obama administration, the USTR's office took up a case developed by Century Aluminum for the WTO that addressed and asked for consultations at the WTO to confront this issue. Since that case has been taken up, Japan, Russia, and Canada have also asked to be uh, a part of those consultations, and the EU has been very supportive of the effort. We're looking to see what happens with the new administration. They have a number of, of uh, weapons, tools, if you will, in their toolbox that they can use. I think you're going to find by the end of this week that there will be an executive order that comes out, and it will address some of this. And of course, we continue to work, work through the global forums such as the G20 to get it on the agenda so that the leadership around the world can address the, the issue. Their market economic status. 
from the Chinese point of view, they, they joined the WTO 2001 with an expectation that 15 years later they'd be granted this full status and be recognized as a market economy. But the world came back to them in December when that anniversary came and said, you have not, you have not executed the reforms that are required in order to meet a market, economic sta a market economy status. So as a result, it's been thwarted. Now, China has asked for consultations. They fired back through the WTO, suing the United States and others for the way we calculate and the methodology used for dumping margins and things like this. So as this goes back and forth, we're going to see a lot of sparks come out of the WTO in the coming months. So what are we doing at the AEC? And I'll end up closing with these. On our scope issues, these are when a importer or exporter who wants to bring extrusions into the United States from China looks at their product and says, you know what, the extrusion orders don't cover my product. I have something different. So they go to the Department of Commerce and they say, hey, we want an exclusion on our product because it's not an aluminum extrusion. We have a very wide scope in our orders and there have been a lot of scope challenges. The curtain wall issue has been a big one. It's a big part of the U.S. aluminum industry and in every case, we've won every scope request, every, every case in the courts, except for one that occurred about a year ago where a judge came back and said, wait a minute, time out, I'm not convinced. Since then, that judge has passed away. That case has been transferred to a new judge. We're now working with him, and we'll see where that ends up by the end of the year. But so far, any extrusions for curtain wall applications continue to be covered by our orders, and that's good news. The 50-50 alloy, you may have read about this. This was deemed a circumvention scheme by the uh, Department of Commerce under the idea of later developed merchandise. Essentially, this, this so-called 50-50 alloy was just playing with the mag and silicon levels in a 6000 series in order to bring it out of the 6000 series chemistry. <clears throat> However, the applications it was going into were traditional 6000 series applications. So under the guise of later developed merchandise, the Department of Commerce found this to be a circumvention scheme and now has prohibited 50-50 extrusions from coming in the United States uh, without duty. Pallets. You may have read a little bit about the pallets. Um, almost two years ago, uh, we went to the Department of Commerce and said, look, there are just hundreds of millions of these pallets in the United States. We believe they're covered by the scope of our orders because nobody's ever sold them as pallets. They're not marketed. They're not, there's no clear evidence they're doing anything but sitting in warehouses, and nobody knows for what purpose. We, we submitted this scope request. The Department of Commerce came back and agreed with us that it is covered by the scope of our, our orders and thus subject to duties. However, they only went as far as saying those pallets made out of 1,000 series alloy. Well, that was the only evidence we had at the time when we filed was on 1,000 series. Since then, other evidence has surfaced and some very strong evidence that 6,000 series has been used as well. So we've refiled a scope request asking the Department of Commerce to also deem those pallets made of 6,000 series alloys to have them covered by our orders as well. In their original ruling, they invited us to do that. We are simply taking their invitation on this and expect to have a good outcome. And the alliances. We couldn't do it ourselves. The AEC is a very, very modest organization. We're about seven to ten billion dollars in a you know a 15, 16 trillion dollar economy. We have to join forces with others. One thing that we've done and my company did was form the International Fair Trade Alliance. This was an effort to bring extruders from around the world together to start talking about what we're seeing in traffic and in uh, circumvention, transshipment, and other effects that are going on outside of China. And we've been able to work with, uh, with uh, members from around the globe to begin to put some data together, and it's already paid off for each of us in a big way. We work with the Curtain Wall Coalition, help them fundraise, help them get their message out. That group started with just really three small curtain wall fabricators out on the West Coast and has now expanded to include extruders, glass companies, a whole litany of uh, members. The Aluminum Association started with the, uh, the MTE, the Manufacturers for Trade Enforcement. This is a group of 30 plus sectors that have come together to really petition the US government to to enter into negotiations with China on the overcapacity issue. 
And th there is a similar organization called Aegis over in Europe that with, with several sectors. Those two have been working very hard on the Chinese market economic status issue, and we support those efforts and contribute in any way we can. The last one was the China Fair, or the China Trade Task Force, CTTF, that was formed by Century Aluminum. When Century Aluminum was drawing up the WTO case, we supported Century's efforts in that regard, and we have since, and we're glad to see the good outcome that they've had so far. The last thing I have to tell you is that I understand one of your key leaders here, the leader, Mr. Pickard. We just thought we know how, how, how much he's loved by you. So his brother, Dan, wanted to be sure that, to let you know that in his earliest childhood, all he could think about was, I can't wait until I'm a part of Israel. And with that, I'll let you go. Thank you. You can put it up there. All right, thank you. I don't know if Joe looked ahead in the slides that you presented to know that that was coming or not. Um, I forgot to mention a couple things. One is um, because I heard some phones go off in the last session, I'm, I'm going to remind everyone, if you could silence your phone just so it doesn't distract the speaker, that would be appreciated. And the second thing I was supposed to remind you to start with is uh, following this session, immediately following, there is a non-ferrous reception, like right as you spill out into the hallway, uh, there will be alcohol. Uh, the, um, the other thing is that the, uh, the next speaker, who is heavily involved in the BIR, um, I forgot ahead of time that we did receive some sad news from the uh, BIR. The first um, uh, Indian head of the London Metal Exchange, Lord uh, Bagri, just recently passed away, and the BIR asked if we could observe a short moment of silence in his honor. Thank you. Uh, all right, next speaker is uh, Salam Al-Sharif, and uh, Salam is a civil and medical, metallurgical engineer who in 1984 graduated uh, as an Aggie. So he went to uh, Texas A&M, his 30 years of hand-on experience in the metals recycling industry has paved the way to lift Sharif Group to regional and global recognition. He told me today at lunch that he has the fourth generation of his company here attending ISRI with him, and he is working on passing on, uh, ensuring sustainability of the group um, through uh, this transition. He is currently heavily involved in BIR in the Bureau of Middle East Recycling. Within BIR, he has been a board member, vice president, and chairman of the ambassador committee. And he is currently president of the Bureau of Middle East Recycling. He's a guest speaker in many, uh, many organizations, and we're very happy to have him here with us at ISRI. If you could help us welcome Salam Al-Sharif. Good luck. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate the opportunity. When I was asked to speak at ISRI, I received an email that I would speak for 30 minutes, and then I get another email by, from Joe asking me to speak for 15 minutes. So I just figured I'll talk for 45 minutes, and I'll wrap it up. Where is Joe? <laughs> no, I'll try to make it brief. Just got a coffee here by Joe, which is really appreciated. With the time difference that I have, I thought I would not be able to make it without a good shot of caffeine. So this is uh, my favorite uh, pie. Strawberry pie is really my favorite, and I thought I would share this with you guys. And somebody would say, what has this got to do with our presentation? Well, this is really not the real pie. The real pie here is the good old black gold pie, which is really having about a 50, about a, more than half the world reserve is lying in the Middle East here, which is why we all think Middle East is the most important uh, uh, source of energy supply worldwide. And as we see here from the slides that more than 50% reserve is within uh, the Middle East uh, in terms of gas and oil. And uh, as we run through the further slides, we see that 10 countries only, GCC are seven, and three other countries, Iran, Iraq, and Syria, possess that huge reserves of uh, 
of energy supply, and this is what makes the Middle East is the most important uh, source of supply for energy. And why I talk about this is since this is spotlights on aluminum, I thought I would just share with you how aluminum came into the Middle East before we get into more details. Now, um, with a lot of uh, oil reserves and the production of that uh, uh, in the uh, last millennium, starting off here in the Gulf countries in the uh, um, late 60s, more or less, depends on which country has started off with. Now, the abundant uh, oil and gas supply have brought, brought a lot of uh, foreign direct investments into the region. And by the way, I'll be running through the slides quite quickly here to maintain the time brevity. So uh, huge investments of uh, foreign direct investments have been pouring into the Middle East, and that has been the main development uh, for the region. And we see here the petrodollars from the exports of oil and I repeat, petrodollars. Now, had it been petro-euros or petro-RMBs or maybe petro-yens, somebody could get in trouble. And this is why you hear a lot of stereotypes about Middle East being always in tension and a lot of political unrest and et cetera. So that's a lot of linkage between this issue that I will not uh, comment on. I don't want to politicize any of my comments. However, that huge wealth has brought a lot of GDP per capita income to the Middle East. And with that, it has kind of changed and diversified the economy into a booming economy in different parts of the sectors, as we see here in these slides, in transportation, aviation, infrastructure development, residential, the tourism, and uh, energy and water, uh, healthcare, education, etc. We see a lot of huge investments, which is worth $2.54 trillion within the GCC, and that is really something that has transformed the region from a fishery and pearling industry in the early 60s into one of the fastest growing economies in the world. And we see here that the transformation, for some of you who have not been into the Middle East, will still think the old tents and camels are still in some of the roads of the main cities. However, as we see here, uh, that transformation, this is a photo that I, when I came into Dubai in 1984, I could see that desert and that main four buildings out here. So uh, it's really been quite phenomenal. In less than 30 years, that transformation has taken place and I brought Dubai into being the main gateway to the Middle East. And uh, after all, that has brought in a lot of wealth to the region, as we see here throughout the uh, investments, which has been in the oil, they thought, well, we should diversify our source of income, not relying on oil, especially that having uh, realized depends on how old, the, 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 depends on the reserves per country. The diversification, the best bet was to invest in aluminum, and because of the abundant uh, oil and uh, gas reserves available, we all know that the aluminum may uh, uh, come it, components of energy consumption relates to the production of aluminum is almost one third. So with that, it makes a good choice of having the um, aluminum production, though it's all imported from the uh, bauxites of uh, Australian mines. We see that with the five major smelters in the Middle East, that makes about 10% of the world production of primary aluminum, almost five point some uh, million tons of aluminum, however, that is within the year 2020, it is expanding into double. Now here we see that the GCC is outweighs uh, 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 North America, West Europe, and other Asian countries uh, if we talk about uh, collective production. And with the doubling that volume in the next, uh, by 2020, that will make about a 20 to 20 some percentage of the worldwide aluminum production. And that is adding a lot of importance to the region for our topic here that we realize with the, um, the economic uh, center being focused in this region with a lot of diversified economy planning as well as foreign direct investments and relaxed policies that the Gulf states are trying to uh, make it available for foreign investments and the direct, uh, the diverse force workforce which is basically either from Asia where it's quite affordable so if you have the affordable workforce as well as the energy, you really can be competitive quite enough in selling your products. 
Now, that makes it a key destination for the rest of the uh, Middle East and the globe because of its uh, serenity to Asia and quite convenience transportation and the uh, freight uh, convenience. Now, the downstream industry in the Middle East had to come along because with the entire uh, primary aluminum production, we see that for the uh, extrusions, for the constructions, that is being, in fact, uh, one of the main contributors to the development of the region and expanding in urbanization, we see here that we, they, they need a lot of aluminum, which thought of having been localized by getting the downstream industry in a big investment. Um, so that has been an opportunity and a major uh, player for the region with regards to uh, if we see the construction, which at one stage the developing countries possess about 50 odd percent of the worldwide constructions in the region. At, at one stage, Dubai alone had 25 percent of the world taller cranes lying there between the 2006 to 2010. And with that uh, generation of a lot of scrap metals, it goes into uh, the buildings as well as the downstream industry of the packaging as well as the automobile industries. As we see here, that uh, generates a big source of scrap metals that is part of it gets consumed within the country in the, in the secondary aluminum productions. And the other part gets exported to the rest of the world wherever there's a good home for it. So the idea is, Basically, instead of exporting energy as oil or gas, you can have the component of the product exported out, which makes a lot of sense and more convenient for countries which have a higher cost of energy and higher cost of uh, manpower. So with the importance of the Middle East due to that major industry related to the strategic location and develop, developed infrastructure, low tariffs, and high communication facilities, as well as abundance of uh, oil and uh, gas reserves, that has been quite ideal for foreign investments. Now, I thought I would share with you some of the facilities or some of the uh, recycling operations in the Middle East, and I thought we uh, have been the leading uh, Middle East uh, recycler, and uh, I'm running the third generation, and we have 11 yard facilities in the Middle East. We recycle ferrous and non ferrous non ferrous is about 250,000 tons a year, and ferrous about 360,000 tons a year, where we have three shredders, and we produce throughout our 11-yard facilities quite a handsome amounts of uh, scrap, which will be generated, and I'll share some of the slides with you. Through our headquarters here in Dubai, we control through very environmentally sound surroundings out here, quite a mechanized and uh, high standard operations while keeping the safety in our high consideration. This is one of the bird eye views of our facilities in the UAE. And uh, this is one of the 11 yard facilities. The first yard is having more of aluminum than copper. However, being aluminum spotlights, I thought I would have some of the generated scrap of aluminum that is coming out of the downstream industry, something either uh, post-production or post-consumption uh, scrap generation. And here we see different grades of aluminum and I'll run through the slides quite quickly here. It's kind of familiar to all of us here. From the cabling industry, powerhouses, and the extrusions that formulates most of the uh, sources of metals. UBC is also a big uh, material that we handle alone. We handle about uh, some 2,000 tons monthly within the UAE alone. There is about half a, a trillion, 500 million cans that gets uh, generated uh, uh, that is uh, yearly, and that is on the average of about soda pops, five soda pops per capita. It's a lot of consumption considering a lot of other developing uh, countries. And these are some of the UBC's photos that have been taken through our yards, which is Alcoa Specs. Class material also gets generated, class one, two, three, four, uh, and that is gets uh, traded from the uh, can stock makers directly into the homes of uh, different buyers. Um, here we run uh, three aluminum, secondary aluminum production plants in the Middle East. That uh, generates about 60,000 tons of uh, secondary aluminum of ADC-12 and LM-24, and you name it. And that goes some to local foundries and some go to 
um, overseas uh, buyers where they have most of the cast houses and the automotive uh, production uh, like India, for example, and some nearby countries. So this is some of the equipments we have, and this is all uh, basically as per the specs and as per the requirements of our uh, buyers. Copper, I'll run through it very quickly just to show some of the items. We are also trading full range of metals we recycle. And uh, brass, copper, ocean batteries. We have also three plants of lead that we generate about uh, 60,000 tons of uh, primary, I mean, high-grade refined and alloyed lead as well. Uh, well, here is, just to wrap up, uh, just thought I would share with you a few slides about some about the good news and bad news. So some of the good news is here, we've seen in 2016, the metal prices in steel have doubled. We, uh, quite a remarkable recovery in the uh, base metals we have seen. And uh, we have seen the, on the geopolitical stand, the, uh, the uh, nuclear uh, treatment with Iran has been settled out. There has also been a, the vision of 2030 in Saudi and uh, UAE has basically put a lot of uh, infrastructure and opportunities for investment, which kind of put the economy back on track. Now, on the bad news, we see here deficit limit remain alarming because those who had the budget on $100 per, uh, per barrel, now with a 50 coming up from 20-some to 50, still puts them in deficit. And the government spending has been cut where it's, it's more on a rationalization stage to try to lift up the subsidies. And the, the banks have been more of a tight-fisted, which has affected a lot of economic slowdown. So now we have the good and the bad. Anything is missing? Ugly. How about the ugly? <laughs> <laughs> I said nothing. Maybe somebody uploaded this for me. but I. Share everybody's sympathy here. Now, the restructuring and the nationalism, as well as the protectionism and the refugees crisis, has been affecting not only the United States, but the rest of the world in terms of uh, sentiments. And if at least not physically, but you are not really uh, aware of what is the, the direction you want to go into. Should I invest? Should I not invest? And vulnerability is prevailing, which is the worst thing you could ever have. Now, with that, I think I will just... Uh, see that such risks and such unprecedented risks that we have not been accustomed to. We're okay with market fluctuations. We have been dealing with it for ages. We know how to kind of maneuver through. We also have been through a lot of the other uh, the difficulties and challenges of documentations, tariffs, etc., And also with uh, the um, kind of U.S. to different currencies, fluctuations, that also we can deal with it. And with all the risks, I can make it in short. And uh, with the day-to-day -day activities, BMR was founded in 2008 just to sort of a put a platform to the recyclers in the Middle East. And right before that, there was nothing much heard about Middle East in terms of the associations. Now, that puts the kind of the Middle East in terms of linking the East and the West with associations, and it puts it on the recycling map worldwide. And with that, we have done a lot of services to our, uh, our members. We have about uh, 180 members, and last conference uh, where we had the uh, um, contribution of ISRI and BIR and different associations, we had 550 delegates. We really take care of the day-to-day -day difficulties. We try to... Um, service out our clients with what sort of difficulties and the barriers they may have in exports. It depends on which part of the Middle East they come from. And with that, uh, we try to be, uh, as a national association of BIR, we want to make sure that we are on track with a lot of the worldwide associations of metals and uh, uh, reduces the uh, kind of uh, impact of all these challenges. Now, um, with that, uh, I will just share that without the cooperation with all the other associations, we could not have done it. We have been getting a lot of cooperation from ISRI, BIR, CMRA, MREI, and different other national associations of metals. We've been, uh, uh, we had uh, uh, Robin, and we've had also Doug, uh, previous chair, and we've had also uh, Mark have been supporting us in their visits and frequent uh, 
uh, understanding to our region. We've had also with MRAI some unprecedented commercial agreement of contract, which was uh, stipulated out to be ratified by both associations, which puts all the customers and suppliers on one platform, so there will be no confusions, no headache, and that sort of uh, eliminated, I would say, most of the trade difficulties we see on day to day. So this is one photo from the last uh, BMR conference in Dubai. This is our board. Uh, and I would like to announce as a good chair for BIR, the next BIR, which is uh, in Hong Kong. I'd like to see a lot of you out there and followed by Delhi conference, which is unprecedented venue to have in India. And with that, uh, next BMR will be uh, in Dubai. That will be the seventh BMR between the 10th and 11th. If some of you would like to visit the Middle East and enjoy some of the surroundings and have some networking and opportunities and have some sand dunes and uh, desert safaris, don't miss out on this. And I would like to leave it out there. We thank you all for your patient listening and the opportunity from Israel to speak with you here. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, our uh, analyst today, who is um, the only one on our panel that would be able to uh, give some um, direction and prediction on where the markets are going to go, is Mike Southwood from uh, CRU, CRU. Um, Mike is a senior consultant with uh, CRU, and he works in the aluminum area specifically. He joined the company in 2006 via the acquisition of Commodity Metal Management Company. Um, Mike works out of their office is just outside of Pittsburgh and covers the North American aluminum market with a focus on the downstream sector. Mike is a primary contributor to the team's publications and price forecasts and serves as a North American editor for Cruise quarterly aluminum rolled products uh, market outlook. I'm happy to say last time he spoke before our group, he was not feeling well. I made sure he's feeling great today, despite the fact that his favorite New Orleans food was crawfish po' boy but he's still feeling great, and uh, we'd like to bring Mike up and hear what he has to say. Thank you very much, Matt. Appreciate that uh, introduction. I'm not very good at walking around the stage, so I'm going to hide behind the podium here. <laughs> Thank you also to, uh, to Joe uh, and to Isri for uh, another invitation to, uh, to speak to you all today. This will be my fifth time uh, on the Spotlight on Aluminum. Um, and it gets better every time, so I really do appreciate it. I'm starting to feel like uh, Tom Hanks on Saturday Night Live. Okay, some people get it, but obviously, uh, obviously not as funny as, as he is. Um, even though it's great to be here, um, I, I do want to just say that I, being from Pittsburgh, I'm a big Penguin fan, um, so I had to shave my very young playoff beard to be here today. Uh, so if the Penguins do lose, I blame you. <laughs> even though they are playing the Capitals, so I'm sure that you want them to win. Um, also, I wanted to, uh, before, we, before we met today, uh, I talked to Matt, and uh, it's not very often you have a celebrity as your uh, moderator. So I brought my March 2017 Recycling Today. You said that you would sign this. It says you're a man of your word. I hope that you waive the $5 signing fee that we talked about. <laughs> so, anyways, got a lot to get through. Uh, I know we're kind of short on time, so um, let's just go ahead and move on. I'll skip the uh, commercial here for CRU. For those of you who are not aware of who we are, uh, we are an independent group of analysts and consultants based out of London, but we have uh, several offices worldwide, boots on the ground to provide analysis and research to all the markets uh, that may be of interest to you ranging from aluminum to zinc. Uh, if you have any more uh, questions about that, I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards, or you can go to our website at crewgroup.com. So today, uh, I'm just going to give a brief, general sort of overview of the aluminum market, uh, sort of concentrating on the North American aluminum market. Uh, I'm going to talk about demand by product and end use market. Uh, semis, extrusions, real products and castings. Then sort of look at uh, individual uh, end-use markets like building and construction, demand for extrusion, real products, and then also demand in the transport section for those two 
uh, products as well. Also going to talk a little bit about the shift in canned stock uh, capacity over to auto body sheet, then move on to talk about imports of not only canned stock and foil, but also of uh, unraveled aluminum into the U.S., and then move into sort of a price and, uh, price and premium section where I'll talk about our regional premium outlook for 2017, as well as our three-month uh, price forecast, and then sort of talk very briefly about some market uncertainties, Trump trade taxes and tariffs, the four T's. So with that, uh, the outlook for demand in the North American aluminum market is reasonably positive, as many expect that 2017 will build on the growth, growth experienced in 2016. Many end-use markets entered 2017 already on an upward trend, and participants we will look for that to continue. As 2017 began, the overall mood in the U.S. was mostly optimistic, but some have expressed caution with regard to economic conditions and the potential impact of the new administration's policies. The first thing I wanted to show here is our expectation for total semis demand, and then break this into three major product forms, extrusions, roll products, and castings, which you can see in the charts here. Overall demand for extrusions in the U.S. is expected to increase by 2.3% in 2017, while row products demand will grow by nearly 3%. Our expectation of a small year-on-year -year decline in U.S. castings demand this year is a direct result of our expectation for slightly lower car and light truck production and continued declines in the truck and trailer market. Next, we will look at our expectations for two of the main end-use markets, building and construction and transport, and our forecast for both roll products and extrusions demand in each of these markets. We'll start with building and construction. Now, demand growth in the building and construction market is expected to be maintained in 2017 and remains a standout market for roll products, especially for those producing building sheet and commercial fin stock for air conditioning units. In addition, extruders that serve this market are also feeling good about the prospects in 2017, not only in residential, but in commercial as well. In terms of U.S. residential construction, activity in the single-family sector was very robust in 2016 while the multifamily sector, on the other hand, was down. As such, the strength in single-family starts was a key reason uh, for firm shipment growth to the B&C sector in 2016. In 2017, crew estimates that housing starts could total 1.24 million units, which would equate to around 870,000 single-family units. As such, our current forecast is for a 2.9% year-on-year increase in consumption of roll products from, from the BNC market. However, this could be a conservative estimate. BNC will continue be, to be the end use market with the largest volume of extrusion demand this year, and we expect demand will grow by nearly 4%. Now, despite continued strength from the auto sector, CRU expects overall semis demand from the transport market in 2017 will increase only slightly by 1.5%. This is due mainly because of three reasons. One, a slow demand, or slow demand growth rate in the aerospace market. Two, a slightly lower automotive build rate. And three, the expectation that the truck and trailer, mar truck and trailer market will have another rough year. With regard to aircraft plate, crew expects that this market will improve in 2017, but will do so very slowly due to inventory adjustment and OEMs waiting longer to place orders. Narrow body aircraft build rates are rising, and overall build rates are expected to rise over the next two to three years. I'm sorry, one to two, two years, which bodes well for aircraft plate demand. With regard to the truck and trailer market, we still expect that it will continue to struggle this year, but have eased back our estimate uh, in demand, the estimated decline in demand, as orders for Class 8 trucks and trailers have risen since late last year and backlogs have grown. An upward move in this market is an upside risk to our forecast as it would obviously create better than anticipated demand for roll products, extrusions, castings, and other aluminum products this year. For roll products, strong gains in auto will outweigh the expected de decline in demand from the truck and trailer market. As such, despite a lower auto production rate in 2017, CRU expects this is still a strong growth market for roll products this year, and that shipments of auto body sheet to the passenger car market will increase by over 20% this year. We expect that auto body sheet demand will grow at a 14% compound annual growth rate between 2017 and 2021, 
which is pushing the investment in auto body sheet capacity. Looking forward, we anticipate that more aluminum will be used for closures, not necessarily full body conversions like the F-150, but production of aluminum intensive models like the Ford Super Duty will increase this year, helping push up demand. For extrusions, however, an expected large 10% decline in demand from the truck and trailer market this year will pull overall shipments from the transport sector lower. Even so, extrusion shipments to the car and truck market have been very strong, car and light truck market have been very strong. They increased by double digits in 2016, and we forecast additional growth of nearly 3% in 2017. Weeks, whoops, can I go back? I hit the wrong button. Oh, it didn't move, Never mind. <laughs> we, we expect that extrusions will continue to increase penetrations, but a slowdown in build rates could hamper growth a bit this year. In 2016, 60% of total vehicle sales were SUVs and pickup trucks, which was up from 56% in 2015. This increased market share was good news for the aluminum industry in general, as more aluminum castings, sheet, and extrusions are used in these vehicles than other models. We see this trend continuing as more trucks and SUVs like the Chevy Silverado and Ford Expedition are slated to use more aluminum in coming years. In the US, the large investment in auto body sheet uh, capacity is at the expense of can stock capacity, as major producers shift from producing can stock to auto body, stock, auto body sheet. As such, we expect US can stock capacity will decline by one third, about 800,000 tons, and over the next 10 years. This is because there will be no major hot mill investments, and the capacity at the hot mill to produce can stock will be converted into ABS at some mills. What this means is that the capacity available to can stock, most noticeably at the hot mill, will be significantly reduced. The key point to this, and where the constraint will really be felt, is the shortage of hot mill capacity. CRU expects North American can stock demand will decline over the next five years. Even so, there will be a shortage of can stock supply in the domestic market. We expect imports will gain more share as more domestic can sheet capacity is converted to auto body sheet. As such, the US will move from being a net exporter of can stock to a net importer of can stock. Now, while not large in volume, imports of can sheet into the US have been on the rise. In 2016, total imports of can sheet to the US rose by 31% year on year. Imports from China to the US rose by nearly 50% last year and made up 91% of total US can sheet imports. As stated in the prior slide, we expect this trend will continue and can stock imports will rise as more imports will be needed in order to satisfy domestic demand. In fact, so far this year, can stock imports are up 24% year to date through February. From a scrap perspective, this is interesting because this imported can stock is not using domestic supplies of UBC or class scrap in its production. But after the sheet is used to make cans for local consumption, the UBCs that are generated will likely stay in the US market. Likewise, the class scrap that is generated when cans are made from this imported can stock will stay in the US market as well, and likely end up back in the hands of domestic can sheet producers. As such, as more imported can sheet enters the US market, it seems likely that more class and UBC scrap units should be generated. Imports of plain aluminum foil uh, were also on the rise in 2016, growing by 12% year on year. Imports from China grew by 16% year on year and made up 73% of total foil imports to the US in 2016. In 2017, CRU expects foil imports to the US will increase by 6%. These imports are now the target of a trade case led by the Aluminum Association. Now, while we expect imports will still be present in 2017, the threat of anti-dumping duties or trade actions could actually cause some US consumers of Chinese aluminum foil and can sheet to look at domestic sources or other imported sources instead of material from China. Now, aluminum semi-finished product markets were not the only ones to see uh, imports rise significantly last year. Imports of unwrought aluminum also saw a large increase. According to trade statistics, total imports of unwrought aluminum into the US increased by, by 28%, or nearly 1 million tons, to total 4.3 million tons in 2016. In a shift away from more traditional uh, supply in, in Canada, 
A majority of this increase in imports last year came from large rises in imports from Russia and the UAE. The reason for such a large increase in imports last year was the result of continued declines in U.S. primary production paired with rising demand. This year, we expect the U.S. import requirement will increase by at least an additional 600 to 700,000 tons as production will decline slightly, warehouse stock levels will continue to fall, and demand is set to increase. With that said, future imports of Funrod aluminum, foil, can sheet, and other aluminum products have a lot to do with the outcome of trade cases and the impact of potential policies and political actions. Now for probably the part that everybody cares about, the price and the premium. The anticipation uh, that the U.S. market would need, more in, need to import more primary metal in order to satisfy growing demand, in addition to shrinking warehouse stocks, were major causes of the Midwest premium rising early in the year. The premium need, needed to rise to a level that would be able to attract metal units to the region. As such, the U.S. Midwest premium saw the most drastic change amongst regional premiums, as it increased from 7.5 cents a pound in Q4 of 2016 to 10 cents per pound in Q1 of 2017. In our base case, we forecast the U.S. Midwest premium will rise slightly quarter on quarter throughout 2017 and end the year at an average of 10.5 cents per pound in Q4. The premium will need to rise in order to compete with the higher Asian premium as more imports to the U.S. will be needed in the second half of the year. This estimate could be conservative as premiums may need to rise higher than expected this year. We believe the Midwest premium will subs subsequently continue to increase as the market deficit grows, though at a slower pace. And, then, and we believe it will reach 12 cents a pound by the end of 2018. Now, our view for the Midwest premium has received an injection of uncertainty in the form of uh, potential trade barriers from the U.S., if import tariffs are introduced, it would lead to even higher U.S. Midwest premiums, as the U.S. is short of metal. The rise would most likely be a step change to the current premium. Now, CRU has upgraded its average 2017 LME three-month price forecast to uh, 1880, which is up about $130 a ton from our prior forecast last quarter. We upwardly revised our forecast due to the following reasons. There has been firmer Chinese aluminum uh, demand growth, stable headline economic data, and we expect the Chinese market for Q2 2017 will be more balanced, with less of a surplus uh, due to better demand. We expect a modest downgrade to Chinese exports in 2017 on lower shipments to Vietnam and some reduction in sales linked to upcom upcoming anti-dumping cases. In addition, there remains uncertainty around Chinese environmentally-led closures. As the policy does not come into effect until November, it will still act as a bullish influence on the price, even if it eventually disappoints. We are also factoring a greater focus on the fundamentals outside of China. LME stocks are below 2 million tons and are set uh, to fall significantly lower, as 870,000 tons of stocks are expected to be delivered out of LME warehouses this year. Also, higher physical premiums are a real sign that the market is in deficit outside of China. However, we continue to be bearish on the aluminum price for the second half of 2017, as we expect record Chinese production growth and for reported stocks in China to break prior records, prior records by Q3. Also, there is a belief that the market has overestimated the impact of the environmental policy in China and that there is a significant chance that major producers will cut less than directed. On a more near-term view, over the next three to six months, we expect that China will be balanced in Q2, and stocks there should be flat, albeit close to record levels. Chinese environmental policy will not come into effect until November, like we said, and even with the policy, we expect China will return to surplus in Q3 and Q4. Therefore, at some point, the basis for the price will weaken. Now, the sheaf price will be the quote-unquote canary in the coal mine, and will signal how effective Chinese environmental policy will be. We think that the sheaf price could fall sharply once stocks start to rise again, and this will take the shine off the LME rally. 
Now, in the U.S. aluminum scrap market, we understand that the demand situation for both mill grade and secondary units has been good. However, the supply situation is different for the mill grade than in the secondary grade markets. We understand that there is a healthy supply-demand balance in the market for mill grade scrap units in the U.S. with high demand and sufficient supply. In 2016, when the LME price was relatively low, more P1020 was used in place of scrap by the mills as, as it was economically viable to do so. In 2017, the price has continued to rise, making the use of P1020 in place of scrap no longer viable. We do expect that the LME will fall during the second half of 2017, but not to levels that make substituting P1020 for scrap a good move. As such, we expect that the use of scrap in the production of semis in the U.S. will increase by 1.4% year on year this year. In the secondary uh, grade scrap market, demand is good as well. However, we understand that supply is an issue, as there is not as much scrap readily available. This is despite warmer weather and, and higher fair scrap prices, increasing flows of post-consumer scrap into the yards. Now, Twitch is demanding a pretty hefty price at the moment, increasing by nearly 10 cents a pound since the beginning of the year. As such, the high price is causing more and more secondary scrap units to go into the shredders to create Twitch, rather than, rather than it being segregated to make other products which is creating a tight supply of secondary scrap. Market contacts do not expect these supply-demand dynamics in both the mill-grade and secondary scrap markets to change any time in the near future. The export market has also been picking up a bit in 2017, for the first time in a while. Every month since November 2013 has registered a year-on-year -year decline in the amount of scrap exported from the U.S. to China. However, in December, in December of 2016, this changed as imports started to improve on a year-on-year year on year basis for the first time in three years, which continued for the first two months this year. While not huge gains in volume, an increase in exports this year would also help the shredders. Now, a year ago at this time, a lot of companies were shutting down or close to shutting down, but have recently gotten a little bit better. Shredders are getting healthier with higher twitch prices and are enjoying a more balanced supply-demand uh, dynamic, dynamic in that market. There are still consolidations in the industry, and market participants expect this will continue to occur. Overall, we understand that the U.S. scrap market is getting healthy again, with pricing at levels the market has not seen for a long time. Crew understands that a lot of people who were sitting on inventory are now, are now starting to sell that inventory for a profit. But you guys know a lot better <laughs> about that than I do. Now, of course, there are risks around any forecast, and I think it is safe to say that there is a large degree of uncertainty in the North American aluminum market due to a variety of reasons, which I don't have time to get into today. Uh, two causes of this uncertainty have been the changing political climate in the U.S. and the increasing rhetoric on trade. Looking forward, CRU believes that changes in trade flows, both due to potential changes in free trade agreements and potential action against primary aluminum, semis, and finished goods from China, could have the greatest impact on North American aluminum demand. Meanwhile, continued declines in production of primary aluminum and certain aluminum products in the U.S. will result in a greater dependence on imports of this, of this material. Even so, our base case remains broadly positive for primary aluminum and aluminum products consumption in North America, but the risks and uncertainties have grown. In conclusion, it is uh, very early in the process to judge exactly what trade policies will be proposed by the new administration, which policies will be enacted by Congress, and the actual timing of such implementation. <clears throat> Excuse me. However, this is a critical topic to the aluminum industry, with profound consequences all the way through the value chain, should any such changes be enacted. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank you all for your attention. Um, hopefully we have some time for questions. If not, um, like Matt said, there's going to be a, a reception. I'll be there having a, a hurricane or something. But uh, be happy to take any of your any of your questions, and thank you very much. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, we uh, have asked Harry Dillman from um, Penex Aluminum to come and present on a, uh, some of you have read some of the ISRI leadership updates. There is a problem in the, that's been creeping up over the last four years with boron in the aluminum stream. And what we're going to try to do is give you a quick tutorial to save you from potentially experiencing 50, 100,000, multiple $100,000 
claims by accidentally buying this type of material and shipping it into some place and blowing a heat. So uh, because we're short on time, Harry's got a lot of experience in the industry, and here he is. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Matt. Good afternoon, everyone. As Matt talked about, uh, my mission here today is to try and educate everybody the best that I can on a, a scrap metal unit that's out there. It's a pretty nasty metal unit, and uh, it, uh, it creates a lot of damage in uh, the secondary facilities that it can get melted in if it gets there. Oh. We'll start with the second slide. So I, I'll start with what it looks like a little bit. Uh, you could see when you came in, there's a table right outside the door that has some samples on it that uh, show some of the different uh, ways it can show up. It looks like an extrusion scrap, uh, looks like a regular mill product scrap that would go into different uh, secondary facilities, making round ingot uh, billet or slab. And it can be shiny, it can be dull. Uh, what you gotta be watching for is fractured surfaces, uh, grainy appearances. You know, you could see some different butt ends and billet ends and how rough the surfaces are. Uh, the first thing I'd recommend is if you're a junkyard and billet butts and sheared pieces are showing up in your junkyard, that should be a single to stop. Most of that stuff should never end up in a junkyard. It should go to a secondary facility like Penex or a Lexan, who I do want to stop for a second and mention Tom Horder, who's really been the architect around this, uh, this effort, and his passion is great around it, and uh, for a lot of reasons that we'll talk about as we go here. You can see a, a flat stock, how t teared up the edges are and how grainy and fractured the surface is. So why is boron carbide scrap so bad? Cast aluminum raw materials, most notably billet and rolling ingot, must meet specifications that uh, fall under the chemistry uh, composition limits, and they also must be crack free. High boron levels render the result resulting batch of metal as unusable because of the maximum boron content specified for nearly all aluminum alloys is very low. Boral or metamac, which in this presentation for layman's terms is boron scrap, uh, contains five to 10 percent of the allowable limits in the AA specs we work to. Also elevated boron levels called billet cause billet and rolling ingot to crack. By disrupting the grain refinement process, the cast house is used to control solidification and avoid cracking. So we don't only deal with the chemistry issue, we also deal with the materials. So the material's unusable because of chemistry, and then we also deal with when we do get it out of a pit and to a saw and we cut it, it's all cracked. So it's uh, unusable material for those two reasons. Boron accumulates in, in melting and holding furnaces in the form of a heavy sludge that settles at the bottom. Dilution of the boron takes several heats or batches of molten aluminum, resulting in multiple scrapped heats. There are uh, secondary rounding of facilities that have experienced uh, a glut of this material, and they had it for four to five days in their process where they were working through it, trying to uh, dilute it enough to get them out of trouble. What does a typical boron carbide incident cost? Due to the lingering nature of boron contamination, the disruption typically lasts for a day or more as cast houses have struggled to identify the actual scrap pieces that contain the boron. So the boron levels in the melting and holding furnace can be diluted to an acceptable level. Each incident, depending on the severity of the contamination, costs between $40,000 to $500,000 in lost production costs. Over the last few years, the Eastern US billet producers have collectively suffered losses of over $2 million due to the boral scrap contamination. If the boral scrap, scrap can be tracked back to the scrap supplier, claims for the recovery lead to the cost 
passed on to the scrap suppliers and legal costs when parties can't agree and damages need to be covered. So with that, we'll end with the last one here. Note to the scrapyard brokers and handlers, any Borel or Metamex scrap, again, known more notably as boron scrap, mixed in a load of aluminum scrap will cause substantial losses at a remelter. Remelters have encountered Borel and Metamex several times in the last six years. So it's really around 2010, 2011, where this stuff started showing up. It predominantly has showed up in the Northeast and the Midwest uh, states. And uh, you know, from everything we know, that's, that's been the, the region that it's kind of been uh, uh, circulating in. The Boral Scrap has div driven remelters to improve their traceability practices to the point where we know who supplied each load and what it contained. Remelters have no choice but to seek compensation from the scrap suppliers who have mixed boron containing scrap in the load of aluminum scrap. The last thing any of us would like to do, we're, I'm a customer uh, of a lot of people in the room today. Uh, the last thing we would ever like to do or have to do is sit across a table with a supplier and talk about damages. Uh, the uh, $40,000 to $500,000 in losses are, are real numbers. Uh, they're numbers that have turned up in these discussions when somebody's sitting across the table that uh, supplied some boron scrap into a secondary rounding at facility. So it's important that we, uh, we try and educate and pass on as much information as we can based around our hardships and what we've learned. So again, Outside the, the room, there's a table with some samples. You can touch them, you can feel them, you can uh, get a flavor for them because uh, it's made from a powdered billet that uh, you're gonna have 10 to 30% boron carbide contamination in it. And if you shoot it with a gun, any of those samples out there, they're gonna come back 60, 61, or 1100, depending on what the base metal was that the boron carbides were mixed with. So it's not something that a gun's gonna help you with, it's really something you gotta visually be looking for, pay attention to it. Uh, when we get it, we're gonna see it in our chemistry once we get it to a molten state, because that's where we can read boron at. So uh, I hope everybody uh, learns a little bit and stops at the table and uh, sees what's there. Thank you. All right, thanks, Aaron. Um, we have, uh, we have just a few minutes for questions. I know everyone is, is anxious to get out in the hallway, um, but one quick question is uh, for Harry. I'm assuming there's some people who right off the bat are gonna say, can we get a copy of that to show the pictures to the guys in the yard? Some of that has been shared in his re, uh, updates in the past, and, and Joe, um, you wanna be the point person for that, to forward that on? So Joe Pickard at ISRI, if you are interested in getting that and sharing that with your yard uh, people so that they can be on the lookout for that. All right, uh, same drill, so we're ready for some questions. Edward. Yes. Correct. Can, hold, hold on one second. The, can the people, for the people in the back, the question was, what's going to happen if China does get market status in the WTO? It gets a little bit technical, but it has to do with the calculation of, uh, of uh, the uh, uh, subsidy margin. Um, in, in a, when dealing with a non-market-based economy, uh, the U.S. government does not use that country's production numbers for inputs because they, they don't believe them to be real or reflective of, of uh, a market economy. So they'll go to a, a third country that they put at the same economic development status of, in this case, China, and they'll use that country's inputs from their industry as a substitute. As a result of that, we will see, normally we'll see those margins be higher. If we use the Chinese figures, there would, and if you took them at face value, there would be nothing to calculate. Okay. 
Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. Just so everybody could hear, is the question was what's being done about it? Is the Aluminum Extruders Council uh, tried to work with the manufacturers of this type of metal? We know of one main manufacturer in uh, in Ohio that uh, I personally have gotten to work with uh, to make sure that per that company understands everything that's involved and the liabilities that come with the material that they uh, produce every day. And uh, that company has been warehousing their scrap. Again, this uh, material, it's not a piece of metal that's going into the automobile industry. So it's not in mass production. It's a very small quantity of scrap generated every day. But they've been warehousing all of their scrap for the last five to six years, uh, trying themselves to come up with a way to recycle it in their process. Again, everything starts with powder, boron carbide powder, uh, 6061 powder, 1100 powder. So they're doing different methods to try and grind this stuff down into a powder form and recycle it again and not let it get out into the industry. There is metal out there though that we've seen over the last year. We know of three or well, four now secondaries that have been hit with uh, this type of metal in the last year. All right, any additional questions? Yes, sir. Can't hear you. We're, we're going to need you to speak up a little bit. So, so the question is, essentially, are the, if the tariffs, if we move into a more protectionist environment here and the tariffs are placed, put in place, net effect, positive, negative, for us in this room or for whom? Yeah, for, us. for us in this room. Why don't uh, we start with your opinion, Jeff, and then maybe Mike. I'm not sure I have an answer for you on that uh, as it relates back to scrap. Um, so I think I'll, I'll pass to others, maybe Mike. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one um, because there's so many different avenues that this could go down. Um, and unfortunately, with as much analysis and research as we want to put into this and come up with all the different scenarios, until something actually happens, we're going to have to react. And I think everybody here in this room is going to have to react pretty quickly as well. There's going to be probably some sort of, not warning sign, that's a bad word, but I mean, some sort of indication that these things might be coming down the road. Um, so we might have a better idea of then. But I think in general, as far as a net net effect, it really depends on what actions and what policies are, are pursued. If it's a 20% across the board, uh, sort of flat tax against everything coming in from China, first of all, I don't even know if that's legal. Um, I'm not an a tax, international tax expert. Um, but that would, I think, be, would be a net bad situation uh, for US consumers, for people in, in this room. Um, if it targets individual products like the aluminum foil um, case, that's a different story. Uh, you can sort of dissect that differently. In that particular case, um, the interesting aspect is that as, as a country, we don't make enough aluminum foil to satisfy our domestic demand. We don't produce enough. So if we do end up losing those export <laughs> imports of aluminum foil, where is it going to come from? Um, so it might be a net gain for people who still produce the light gauge foil today, which is very simple, like very seldom. Not many people do it in the United States anymore. So in that situation, maybe a net gain could be non-Chinese importers of aluminum foil 
from Russia and Armenia and other countries like that. So you really have to take it on an individual case-by-case -case basis because I really don't think, and I don't think CRU, I, I, I don't know if I can speak for, <laughs> for the company, but I, in my own personal opinion, I really don't think uh, that a broad 20%, 15%, sort of uh, adjustment, border adjustment tax is, is, is going to fly. So I think it's going to be individualized uh, per product, per country, uh, things like that. So at, at that point, you need to look at it. But I don't know if that answers your question, but it's a difficult question to answer. All right. It, as much as I'd love to hear from Stanton Moss, I've learned a valuable lesson moderating these over the, in the past, and that is, at an ISRI function, you never stand between alcohol <laughs> and the attendees. And there is alco alcohol waiting. Is it going to be a really short question, Stan? All right, it's got to be really short. All these people are really pissed at you right now. Yeah, it's, again, Staten's question is, is anybody working with the people that are manufacturing the scrap that's getting out there? And Staten, uh, yes, the answer is, uh, we have tried to educate them on all the legalities and liabilities that follow. Uh, what we hear from that company is, for the last five to six years, they have not sold a pound of scrap out there that I know of only one, but there are others in the group. Again, Tom Horder has uh, really spent a lot of time uh, trying to understand this whole, uh, how this all developed and how this crap got into the market. And he has come across some others, but uh, the one that I know of Stanton, they know firsthand they'll be held liable if uh, they sell it to a yard who sells it to somebody like us and uh, we end up with a claim. <laughs> Sorry, Stan. Well, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for attending this session. Uh, I'd like to thank Jeff, Salam, Mike, and Harry. Thank you very much for, ha for helping us out.